SEC and the Jay Barker Show. He joins us every Monday here on the program. Good morning, Scott. Top of the morning to you, Gary. How you doing, man? What's happening? Doing well. Lot to lot to cover today, so let's uh, let's dive right in and let's begin with uh, with the Heisman Trophy ceremony on uh, Saturday evening in New York City. Uh, it's it's kind of I think unfortunate to some degree that uh, like everything in the world, we just can't wait anymore. You basically know the outcome before you uh, before you have the event. It was a foregone conclusion that Joe Burrow would would win it based on all the polling and all the things that they do. And indeed he did uh, in record fashion, uh, beating out uh, Jalen Hurts and the duo from Ohio State, Justin Fields and Chase Young. And this dream season for LSU continues. I, You know, it's been, uh, you know, I, 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 I hearken back when I was watching that ceremony, Scott, to, to Coach O a couple years ago. We're coming. Yeah. You know, he said it right here in Tuscaloosa when Alabama, you know, Alabama beat him. And then, uh, and then handled them last year in Baton Rouge, twenty nine nothing. But he never backed off. He never backed down. He said, "We're coming. Uh, we're going to get them, and we're going to get to the top." And you know, you've done this before. You've given him plenty of credit, but he certainly deserves it because uh, it's not just one thing to to talk it, but uh, they've walked the walk. Uh, they're the best team in the country right now. I think we'll see if they can win that championship. But they're thirteen and zero. Uh, they got a Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, Coach O is the coach of the year. Uh, they they won a lot of college football awards at the uh, Home Depot College Football Awards Show, and then, as I said, got the biggest one of all with the Heisman Trophy. Their first since uh, since Billy Cannon in 1959. So 60 years ago, they won their only Heisman, and then they get another one with Joe Burrow. Well, it was certainly deserving, and uh, you know we, we've heard this before. I remember, I remember Mark Ingram once said at Alabama, "Look, like, how fragile is the season." He probably said that after Nick Saban said it, but uh, listen, the difference between you know going thirteen and zero and playing for a national championship is a bounce here and a bounce there, and that's that's the, and you got to have it. You got to have sure it is. You got to have uh, you know every everything's got to go your way. I mean, people, you know, we we talk about this all the time. You people are disappointed. Bama's got ten wins uh out there and i totally understand that but i don't think people realize how hard it is to go win 10 games or 11 or 12 much less go undefeated in the sec it is so very hard to do i mean we have not seen the lsu team uh do this ever i mean i'm I'm trying to look back at the last unbeaten untied lsu team and i can't remember the last time it happened it's been probably 50 years uh i may be missing it somewhere along the line but and they may not go undefeated. Who knows? But the point That's right. is that up to right now, they have been they've been dominant. Every time they've been pushed, it was Joe Burrow that went back out there, got a first down, uh, got a got a third down conversion, made a throw, made a play. Edwards Alaire turns a five yard run into a ten yard touchdown, and all those things add up. And all of a sudden, you find out you're thirteen and zero. But they played their best football down the stretch. Uh, they got by Alabama. They they got by Ole Miss. That was kind of a gut check emotionally. But then this team went into a second gear, defensively, offensively. And here's the key thing, as I mentioned, didn't have a real, I mean, a major injury all year long. They had some guys miss some time, but not significant time. So, uh, listen, when you when you got to go win a national title, everything's got to come together for you. And right now, this team, uh, Ohio State, Clemson. Uh, and obviously Oklahoma have all had their share of luck this year to get where they are. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And you, you said about you know how difficult it is to, to run the table in the SEC undefeated, and, and Nick Saban's done it, done it several times and still has only had the one perfect record in his coaching career, and that was 2009. And LSU, a Saban's national championship had one loss. Les Miles' national championship, people forget, had two losses. So, yeah, they're on the right. cusp of uh, – of a 15 and in 0 season. As far as Heisman speeches go, for Burrow, um, this was a good one, Scott. It really was. And I thought I think the thing that that struck me was he's had a reputation since he's been at Eric at LSU, earned I think, is arrogant, cocky, brash. But I think you saw, uh, you know, the 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 layers peeled off a little bit. And this was a yeah. kid who three years at Ohio State really didn't play and was at a crossroads as far as his college football uh, career. We may not, you know, without this portal and the way the games change with the ability to, to graduate and transfer and be eligible immediately, we may not have ever heard of Joe Burrow. 
But Joe Burrow, after being really uh, a very lightly recruited player out of high school, wanted to go to Nebraska where his dad and two older brothers had played, didn't get an offer from them, uh, didn't get many offers at all. But Ohio State, he's from Southeast Ohio, did offer him. But he goes up there, and he's basically a backup quarterback. Uh, put a lot of time and effort into, into transferring. Alabama was on the list of schools that he considered, but settled in, in Baton Rouge and last year had a decent year. You know, I think everybody saw the kid was talented and, and did some good things, but uh, was, you know, was just considered a good player. And then Joe Brady comes in, they changed the offense. And I think you saw uh, how much this meant to him to be a guy really that we didn't even know who Joe Burrow was two years ago to then win the Heisman and, and shatter all the voting records. Uh, very humble. I thought he thanked everybody that had his hand in his career. I was moved by his speech, Scott. I'm curious if you were. Hey, listen, absolutely I was. Interesting thing, this is going to be the first time ever that the Heisman Trophy winner is going to be older than the NFL MVP. And That's right. And you know, Burrow's 23 years old and and, uh, you know, Lamar Jackson is still, you know, I don't even know if he's at drinking age yet. Uh, may, and may, listen, what, what Joe Burrow said the other night, um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times, uh, Gary, quarterbacks can be, uh, can be uh, the most disliked uh, characters in all of college football, depending on where they come from and who they play for, right? And uh, this batch of quarterbacks that we've had in the SEC uh, over the last several years, it is amazing the leadership and and the kind of people they are off the field. And I'm talking about Jalen Hurts. They play at Bama now, Oklahoma. I'm talking about Jake Fromm and Tua, and uh, and obviously Joe Burrow. They're they're really great stewards of the game. They're all good leaders. They're good people. Um, their programs. Uh, they have put their programs on their back and carried them, and uh, and they've done a fantastic job. I mean, Joe Burrow is. Uh, uh, his story is, is amazing, and and I think one of the things he said the other night that really stood out to me is, hey, for all those people in southern Ohio that don't think they can get there and all those people that are having trouble eating tonight and in, in impoverished areas in Ohio, this is for you. So one thing about him, he's never forgot where he came from. He's very, very grounded. And his journey began in Ohio, and you know what? It may take him to Ohio as well because it's hard not to see him not ended up with the Cincinnati Bengals as the number one overall pick, but he is uh, he is dangerous. He's been the most effective quarterback in the country, and he has made play after play after play, and it's because of him and what he can do with his legs and arm and his mind that I think they got a great chance to go close this thing out and win the national championship. Yeah, he also thanked Ohio State, which I thought was uh, – yeah. Um, was was not a nice touch, and and again, we're in the transfer era now. You had three quarterbacks at the Heisman Trophy ceremony, and all three of them were were transfers. And you know, Jalen's kind of the same way. Uh, Joe Burrow got his degree, uh, and he may get a, a graduate degree from from LSU, but he got his uh, bachelor's degree from Ohio State. Jalen Hurts spent four years at Alabama, so we always attach these players now with the final school or the last school that they were they were at. And when they go into the National Football League, that's the school that. They, you know, Jalen Hurts will be listed as being from Oklahoma, and Joe Burrow will be listed as being from from LSU. But uh, both those players spent more time at their their first schools than they did their second school. And and for him, as you said, to to, to really reach out to those people in, in Southeast Ohio, but also to acknowledge Ohio State, I thought that was a uh, I thought that was a telling moment too, because you could tell he was grateful to Ohio State for offering him a scholarship when not many people were. And that is what ultimately led him to LSU. So it's so easy, I think, at times to to forget that these kids, it's a journey for them. And sometimes, you know, more times in the past it would be at one school. But now sometimes it's two schools or even three You know, we see these guys, but it's all part of their journey. And, and uh, Ohio State played a big role in Joe Burrow getting to where he's at. Yeah, and you know, his father uh, was a – you know, defensive coordinator. He he's a son of a coach, and they're from Ohio. All that stuff. You know, Chase Young said, "Hey, I was a teammate of this guy, and uh, he was a great leader uh, up here while he was here." And you can imagine if uh, yeah, what if Joe Burrow just stuck it out at Ohio State? Uh, it, it wouldn't uh, it would have never worked out because he he left, graduated, had two years of eligibility. Because I've I've read all kind of things about hey, what would have happened if this guy had stayed? You know, if uh, 
Well, let's say Justin Fields had beat out Jake Fromm. It's a totally different offense that Kirby runs down there. He wouldn't have the numbers, uh, wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have the notoriety. Probably would no way of, in, 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 in any way, pop, shape, form, or fashion would have been in New York, you know, for a uh, for a Heisman Trophy ceremony. So it, it worked out very, very well. Uh, this is probably not going to be the norm moving forward. I think this is just. The way everything fell this year, Ohio State was really one playmaker away from being a national title contender. They got that guy. LSU gets their quarterback. They get they get to develop their receivers, and they get a coach that that spreads the field around, and they come together as a team. And it's just really amazing to watch. We'll, we'll see how Oklahoma does. They still got issues on defense, but this transfer portal has created a lot of interesting interesting chatter it has created a lot of interesting situation and uh and teams are are having an opportunity gary to get better because of it and i think that was the design of it all along is that to, to help teams that need a player here and there and obviously guys that weren't you know it hadn't worked out for them somewhere for them to have an opportunity to go on somewhere else and, and further their career so i i guess what we're saying the transfer portal to me right now while it could be tweaked a little bit, it's certainly been a success, and it's certainly been a success for these teams during the playoffs. It's changed the game, no doubt about that. Visiting with Scott Moore, we got a couple more segments uh, to go with Scott. I'm not in studio today, but if you want to call in on the Bud Light Hotline at 205-342-9904, then Josh can take your, your question and pass it along, and we'll be sure and uh, try to answer it for you here on the program. We're back with more from Scott Moore. From iTalk SEC and the Jay Barker Show, we'll get into uh, some Alabama football. The tide goes back to the practice field. And Jerry Judy puts out a tweet that could bode well for the entire Alabama football team in the Citrus Bowl against Michigan. We'll discuss next here on the Gary Harris Show. 9.31. Welcome back to the Gary Harris Show. Josh Smith, keeping with our Christmas music theme. I guess we're just going to uh, we'll just play some Christmas music right up until Christmas because it's uh, just nine days away. Scott, you got all your Christmas shopping done? No, are you kidding? And I hadn't uh, started. <laughs> man, most most guys I've talked to haven't yet, and uh, you know I, I I usually Gary in, in the tradition of, of the past thirty years, it's probably going to take place uh, in, the, in the final forty eight hours. So. I'll be out there. Me too. Like Chevy, Chevy Chase was in Christmas vacation, and you know, trying to have, a, trying to get it all done that that last couple of days. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I've become a big gift card guy, and I know a lot of people say, "Well, that's so impersonal." But you know what? You give someone a gift card, and I love gift cards because then it gives you the the power to get what you want. You know, you get a <laughs> gift card, and and uh, yep, you know. So, well, but I'm I'm like you. I'm not a not a big fan of of Christmas shopping. We are big fans of Alabama football. Scott, the Crimson Tide takes us to the practice field this afternoon for the first time since the Iron Bowl to begin preparations for the VRBO Citrus Bowl against Michigan in Orlando on January 1st. And some good news uh, late last week, Jerry Judy tweeting out that he uh, plans to play in the game. Like, why wouldn't I play? And, and uh, boy, that was music to my ears because I've been yeah. saying all along that I'd like to think that Alabama football – means something to these guys, even if they're going into the draft. It, you, you want to finish what you started. And he's one of the key ones because I think everybody feels like that he's going to go on to the NFL regardless of what other guys do. He's right. going to be a really high pick. And, you know, he would have been one of those guys that if he had decided to sit out, um, you wouldn't be able to say much about it. But the fact that he's tweeted out that he plans to play, I'm, I'm going to think that's going to have a domino effect throughout this football team. Do you agree? I think it will, and uh, you know, for Jerry Judy, uh, you know, one thing about him, he is. Uh, I, I think his best football, Gary, as good as he's been, he's had Tua and other great receivers to to to, to work with every day, and it's been a it's been a trio. And when you had Waddle on there, four unbelievable players at the same time. But I, I, I truly believe that that Jerry Judy is best football is ahead of him. I, I think that when he gets on the team and he's kind of the the main guy. Uh, at, at the receiver spot, and uh, I think he's going to have an unbelievable pro career. And uh, I do think Alabama football means something to Jerry Judy. I think it means a lot to a lot of these guys. And, and listen, I understand it a lot uh, from from all sides of the ball. For, for a guy like Terrell Lewis, 
who has been often injured. And what has he played in 15 healthy games in his career, maybe? Um, I, I can understand him saying, you know what, I, I probably don't need to chance it. And uh, because of the amount of injuries and, and just one play and all that, I certainly understand his situation. But I also think that, that playing with your team and having an opportunity to go out and play a Michigan team and two unbelievable brands in college football down there. And, you know, Alabama began the decade down there on January 1, 2010. And uh, what a decade it was. And they'll end the decade there because it's, kind of, it's kind of fitting. This was just uh, – a. Uh, a really, really crazy year uh, with this football team. And, and uh, again, a bump here, a play here, a play there. Four or five plays that never happened. And, uh, you know, Alabama's probably undefeated going to, and playing for a national title. But, again, you heard me say earlier, how fragile is the season? It comes down to four or five plays. An injury here, a missed tackle here, a pick six here. It's a different it's a different deal. So, uh, you you got to go and play and and I think that this Michigan game it should should light the the fire and stoke the embers for a lot of these kids that that uh, that play in Michigan and Alabama. Gary, I think it's going to be a great great New Year's Day bowl game. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Josh, we got Scott still there. I lost. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, Scott's still here. Okay, okay, I, yeah. he dropped out here. Uh, yeah, uh, I like like I said, I like the way Judy phrased it. Why wouldn't I play? I mean, just like, you know, of course I'm going to play. It's a game. And I'm going to say something else. Uh, well, I guess we'll find out at practice uh, who's sitting out because, to me, mm-hmm. I like what Saban has consistently said. You know, uh, you should want to get better. You should want to add value to your, to your, to your draft status. And uh, if a guy's not going to play in the bowl game, I don't see. I'm not going to waste time practice, coaching the guy. Uh, would right. you, Scott? I mean, if, if you're not going to, no. if you're not going to play. Then so for me, uh, if you don't play in the bowl game, that's that's practice is lost. That's an opportunity yeah. to get better. That's an opportunity to add value. And I know everybody doesn't agree with me, but to me, if you're a football player, uh, this is a chance to continue to get better, work with your team, go out in style, and add value to your draft status. So I'm hoping when we get out to practice this afternoon that most of these guys that are considering leaving early or are seniors that are going into the draft, that we'll see them out there on that practice field. Yeah, and listen, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, if, you're, if you're not going to play, then uh, let's not waste time coaching. Let's not let's, – let, let's, I think Saban said, hey, we, we want to play the guys and we want to coach the guys that want to be here. And uh, I also think that I feel like this team feels like there's a lot of unfinished business uh, I think it's going to filter into obviously when guys are are, are going to decide to go. I think we know who the obvious guys are that are going to go, but I think there's a lot of guys on the fence that are going. You know what? I don't like the way this ended. And you look at you look at the way Auburn was able to get Marlon uh, Davidson back, and and uh, and number five, who's probably the best player on defense in the, around the country this year, Derek Brown was unbelievable. Those guys came back. They could have been high first round picks or, or late first round picks last year. Uh, they came back and solidified and, and made their self, themselves a lot of money this year. Chase Young says he's going to come back. Well, I'll wait and see about that. But uh, you know, listen, the opportunity to to come back and win a title they did it at Clemson a few years ago had five guys that came back and four of them were first rounders. And, and there's uh, there seems to be a lot of sentiment now about guys really rethinking their senior year and really rethinking, hey, going back and being part of a team. You, you can only be in college one time, Gary. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's the most enjoyable part of your life, and uh, it's an incredible part of your life. It's not the most important part, but it certainly is a lot of fun, and you only get a, a chance to do it once. And uh, I think a lot of guys that are making that decision are, are, are weighing all those different things. Sure, millions of dollars is hard to pass up, but it's good to see. It's good to see this year this crop of juniors all across college football, not just in Alabama, that are really, really considering staying. I, I think that's a very, very good trend. I think for this football team, an opportunity to win uh, eleven games and uh, an opportunity to build some momentum. You mentioned uh, what an incredible decade uh, Alabama uh, in two thousand nine. Uh, went undefeated, won the Rose Bowl in early 2010 in Pasadena. The next season, uh, you know, did slip to three losses and went to that bowl game against Michigan State, as you alluded to, and 
and blew out the Spartans, got the 10 wins, and Alabama hasn't won less than 10 games now since uh, since the 2007 season, Coach Saban's first. Already have 10, but looking for 11. And I think, Scott, I know that you know a lot of the guys that are playing in this game won't be on the football team next year. Some guys that, that aren't playing will be a big part of the team in 2020. But I still think these bowl games – can can build momentum, give you a good appetite and good feeling going into the offseason, spring ball. A lot can carry over from a strong bowl performance, in my opinion. Well, there's a bad taste in the mouth last year. Uh, after getting rightfully so, you get beat 44 to 16 in the national title game. And, and Nick Saban talked about the Bama factor. He talked about it often. But uh, given the injuries and, and, and looking at what this team has had to go through in the last calendar year, um, you know, I still think they're trying to get the Bama factor back. And uh, we saw it missing against LSU, saw it missing. Uh, t- take the injuries away. But a lot of youth, a lot of inexperience, and sometimes it's hard to get that Bama factor back when you got so many guys out there playing that, that, that don't really even know how to execute yet. And I think everything that happened this year, Gary, is going to be a phenomenal strength next year. I mean, the SEC is only going to get better. You look at college football in the landscape, the same four or five teams that are trying to get and go win a national title um, are all getting better. And you're right, winning a bowl game and having that offseason, you know, pat you on the back, feel good about yourself deal is a major, major deal. We, we talked about Florida beating Michigan last year, what it meant to their programs to get to, 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 to 10 wins. And once they got to 10 wins, they've they've come back this year had a great season, and have a chance to go get 11 wins as well. And so, and, and Dan Mullen said, listen, the cornerstone of our success last year was winning that bowl game against Michigan in a New Year's Day six bowl game. So, yeah, listen, the bowl game is important. It's important because of Alabama's tradition, because of Michigan's tradition. And, uh, and these two coaches, Harbaugh versus Saban, there's a, yeah, I think there's mutual respect there, but I don't think there's a lot of love between the two of them. So, uh, I mean, these fan bases are proud fan bases. And this is a win that you get in the off season that can carry you through spring practice. And you mentioned something else, Gary, that we don't talk about enough. The bowl practice. I mean, you get 15 practices in spring practice, right? And we see guys get better and better and better over that 15, you know, those 15 practices that are spread over three weeks. This is 14 practices coming up starting today for an opportunity. There are guys that are going to go to practice today, and over the next 13 days, they're going to get better and better equipped and more understanding uh, so they can contribute to the team next year, and then they'll have a spring practice on the back of that. So this is vitally important to, you know, carpe diem, seize the day, and, and go out and get better over the next couple of weeks. And uh, I think that's that's what you got to hammer home. Get the Bama factor back, work on that, finish the season well, and, and, and roll into 2020 with a truckload of momentum. I want to ask you about this season, uh, and clearly injuries, a huge storyline for 2019. Sure. There's no way around it. Having said that, Alabama is 10-2, and two, and in the two games that they lost, even though it was a, would have been a, a big comeback against LSU, uh, and Tua had, had sat out the, the Arkansas game, only played half against Tennessee. He wasn't 100% with the ankle, but still had opportunities in that game, and clearly – uh, even with Matt Jones, the backup quarterback, could have won, maybe should have won at Auburn. So my point is, uh, even with the injuries, even with all the things that happened, this still could have been a 12-0 and football team very easily, Scott, and it's not. Outside of, uh, of the injuries, what do you think was missing? I mean, when there you know, were opportunities to make plays, Alabama made a lot of plays against LSU, made a lot of plays against Auburn, but – I guess for me, it's it's just it's just mistakes. It's it's uncharacteristic things from Saban that you don't expect to have one of the most penalized teams in the country. To uh, you know the the inability to get off the field on third down on defense. You know again continued problems. Even though the return game was incredible, continued problems with with place kicking. Uh, you know didn't find a punter until late in the season. What what do you think kept Alabama? From going twelve and zero, and instead being a ten and two team, and not even in the New Year's Day Six Bowl. Attention to detail. That's. <clears throat> I mean, every you go back and look at the two losses, and 
LSU's a great team. I, I don't think they're, uh, uh, you know, with, with a healthy Tua, I don't think they're a better football team than Alabama. I don't. Uh, if Alabama's healthy that weekend, you got Dylan Moses, and I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm answering the woulda, coulda, shoulda stuff right now. Uh, Alabama's a better team. They they beat LSU. They beat Auburn. Not only did they beat Auburn, they beat Auburn by four touchdowns, okay? Alabama handed Auburn that game. Auburn was not the better team. We can argue that all day. Uh, Alabama went down there. You've heard Paul Bryant say it before. Nobody ever wins a game. Somebody loses it. Alabama lost that game. That simple. And why did they do it? Attention to detail. Jumping off sides uh, on third and four uh, or fourth and four. Um, dropping a punt against LSU. A simple uh, you know, getting ready to punt and the punter, a new punter, uh, because the, the starter couldn't execute. You put another punter in there. You drop a punt. Give a team ten point or, or, or give a team a field goal. I mean, it goes a doinking uh, little things, doinking a field goal off the upright, which uh, it's uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, but you can point to four or five plays uh, this season that if the if, if Alabama just executes on the play, if they just execute, you have twelve men on the field against LSU on an interception that could have turned the entire ball game around. You fumble the ball running into the five yard line on the first drive of the game. You, 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 there are four or five things. Again, attention to detail, Gary. Um, this team was undisciplined early in the season. Uh, we had a couple of games where uh, you know you get a fifteen yard penalty, you keep a drive alive. South Carolina scores on the final play. You get a fifteen yard penalty against Ole Miss, they score on, on the on next to the last play. You started giving up points in situations because you could not what get off the field and execute your defense when you're supposed to. You get a false start. You get a missed kick. You get a bad hold. You get a fumble. It's just little things like that. But there are four or five plays. It usually is four or five plays for a game, right, that it comes down to. This year it was four or five plays across the whole season. You make those plays. Those are plays Alabama has typically made in the past. You make them, you're playing for a national title. Again, that is how fragile a season is. So, to me, it's one thing, attention to detail, and that Bama factor, they didn't get it back this year. Good news is they still have an opportunity. All we got nine guys back on defense that were playing last year. They were either redshirt freshmen or true freshmen. You may get Dylan Moses back. You're going to have a ton of, of experience on offense and defense coming back next year. And everything that happened this year because of the inexperience will be a positive and a really good thing for this team next season. 946 here on the Gary Harris Show. We're going to get to a break and come back with one more segment with Scott. We're going to talk about uh, the, all the coaching changes in the SEC. And these guys make a lot of money, but there's pressure to win. You don't get long to turn it around. It's back with the final segment with Scott Moore from I Talk SEC and the Jay Barker Show. The pressure to win in the SEC, Scott, is intense. Coaches make a lot of money, even at the schools that don't have maybe the football tradition of an Alabama or LSU or Georgia, Tennessee or Auburn. I'm talking, of course, about the Vanderbilts and the and the Missouris. It doesn't really matter. You're going to make a lot of money if you're a head coach at, at an SEC school. And because of that, there's going to be pressure. We saw Chad Morris not even get two complete seasons in Fayetteville. They bring in Sam Pittman. Eli Drinkwitz goes to Missouri. And, of course, Lane Kiffin to Ole Miss. We, we mentioned this last week, but, boy, uh, I like to hire for Ole Miss simply because if, if you're going to shake things up, why not shake them up all the way? We don't know how this thing will turn out, but he's a good football coach. If he can, you know, if he can uh, keep things together off the field, I think he's got a chance to be successful there. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you look at it and uh, you go, okay, what is the ceiling for Ole Miss? And, and I, I think if you're an Ole Miss fan, and I've got a lot of friends that are Ole Miss, so you, you have some as well, Gary. Um, you know, it, to me, it's going to be a battle between Jimbo and Lane on on who could try to tr- tr- crack into the top three. Because the problem is, I don't care how good you are in the SEC West to get just to get to Atlanta. I mean, this is a perspective you got to have just to go play in the SEC title. You're going to have to beat LSU, Alabama, and and Auburn, or a combination of at least two of them to even have a shot. And uh, I can't remember the last time A and M beat all three in a year. I don't think they have since they've been in the conference. I don't think that uh, that Ole Miss has done it. Uh, I think that Ole Miss has, uh, has has come close a couple of times beating all three. 
but that's very, 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 very difficult. So uh, I, I think they could be the fourth place team. I mean, Jimbo is has got a, a number five recruiting class right now, seventy six million dollar contract. Uh, Lane's got to recruit very, very well over there. I think he'll be able to keep some in state people uh, there. Uh, I certainly think they'll become the in state school. Uh, with Joe Moorhead at Mississippi State, Kiffin's got the name recognition. He'll be he'll be able to have a really good staff, and he's probably going to beat somebody every year um, that he's not supposed to. And uh, so it'll be very very interesting. But I look for Ole Miss. Can you get to nine wins consistently? That would be the goal over there. But I think consistent wins over Alabama and Auburn LSU. I I think that's unrealistic for anybody in the SEC West, especially. You know, with the, the current the, the current climate that is the conference right now, it appears uh, that the SEC West is still stronger than the East. And I know Georgia has made a move; Florida's better. But uh, you mentioned it; it's a gauntlet in the West. And uh, if you're in the East, you've got a much easier path to Atlanta. And now with Georgia not being in the playoff, questions at quarterback: Will Fromm come back? Will he leave? Uh, will they change their offense? You know, the Georgia fans have been highly confident since Kirby got there, and, and you and I talked about this on the air. Just because you come close doesn't guarantee you anything. I mean, it, it's one thing to knock on the door. It's another thing to, 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 to knock it down, and they played for a national championship two years ago and then uh, had, you know, like they were going to beat Alabama and win it. And then last year in the SEC championship game, like they were going to beat Alabama and, and, and go on to the playoff. And then this year they get back to Atlanta and get and get stomped, get a mud hole stomped in them by LSU. Florida's making a move. Do you think that that windows uh, of opportunity is maybe closing for Georgia instead of you just being wide open? You, you just said it, and you, you and I were texting last night in, in our group. And, and listen, I think that uh, one one thing about Kirby since he's been there, they've gotten curb stomped every year by an SEC West team. Okay, look, I mean that, that's happened every season now. Uh, at, at Georgia, so uh, they, they've had a very difficult time uh, winning against the SEC West opponents. They were able to win the regular season games this year, but uh, this is the, the the fourth straight year that they've gotten beat by at least double digits by an SEC West team. And so uh, you look at that and you kind of go, are they getting better or are they still at the same distance? So when you're when you're continuing to not be able to measure up to where the expectation for this team this year Gary was to get to the playoffs and go play for a title not two losses right so uh and they're lucky they didn't have more than two losses so uh they got an immense amount of talent over there um they always have had a lot of talent over there but they got nothing on the scoreboard for the last since 1980 to prove anything so they do more talking than any fan base in America they have they have the highest expectation of any fan base in America, and they usually fall flat on their face. And, and yes, I do think the window is closing because next year's schedule is going to be really, really difficult. They got to play Alabama and Tuscaloosa. They got to play Florida uh, on a neutral field, and uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to repeat this and get back to Atlanta next year. Can you imagine if that team and all that talent they don't even win the SEC East? So. And to answer your question about Fromm, I think Fromm is going to have to come back. He had a very marginal season this year, uh, mainly because they had nobody to throw to. We, we talked about that all summer. Uh, there will be a strength for them next year, but uh, it's the same old offense. It's, it's grind it out, pound it out, and play great defense. Hey, that will win you a lot of games. But, Gary, in this climate now, I mentioned that earlier, in this climate now, man, you better have a high-powered offense or you're not going to go win a title. It, it, it's that simple. you got to score points now, and, and, and being able to slow people down is great. We all love defense. Great defense is a great thing to have, but you better have a great quarterback, you better have great receivers, and you better have an offensive line, you better score 38 to 45 points a game if you're going to go to the playoff and win a national championship. All right, great stuff from Scott Moore as always, and of course uh, more to come today as you're just getting cranked up. Yes, sir, man. We got uh, twelve to two, and then uh, a little afternoon show as well, Gary. And gonna take some time off too uh, this next week. So look like everybody else. So looking forward to it, brother. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate it. Hey, man. Thank you, Gary. Merry Christmas to you and your family and everybody down there, brother. Thank you, sir.